we have Ryan Newton from ED, uh, Atomic Primops and Compare and Swap and Cool Stuff from GFC. Hi. So this is a topic that is broadly related to parallel Haskell and concurrent Haskell, um, but it's way down in the least documentation, and the Ableware's workshop is a perfect place for that. But I don't want to assume that people are familiar with these sorts of operations. If anybody saw the keynote talk on day two of ICFP, Peter was uh, showing us this kind of picture where uh, threads that are logically sharing memory, uh, we talked about shared memory parallelism, actually aren't quite sharing exactly the same memory as, uh, as you might think because there's uh, all kinds of instructions that are reordering uh, both by the compiler and by the architecture. So basically, um, your reads and writes uh, don't get out to the real shared memory uh, instantaneously, they go through a write buffer. So what does that mean for programmers? Um, well, to do anything meaningful on a shared piece of mutable data, you pretty much need to both read and write it. So a C programmer might write this statement, a mere four characters, but it's actually doing both a load and a store. So it's doing something like this, and even those two consecutive instructions or three consecutive instructions uh, would be enough time for somebody else to slip in and screw you up. So you need operations that are atomic. And the hardware architectures have provided us this for quite a while. Um, but the number of operations that we can do atomically is always growing. We're getting new ones in Haswell. Uh, in any of the mainstream C compilers, you can access this functionality by using what are called compiler intrinsics. So you can put a compare and swap in your program. Uh, compare and swap is the main one we'll be talking about today. Uh, and I'll show you exactly how that works. But there are also others. And we don't have all these in GHC yet. And I'll come back to that. So there's fetch and add. Uh, fetch a value and do something to it. Uh, there's full memory barriers, which basically say reads and writes cannot uh, migrate beyond this point. That's what a barrier means. Uh, we've got others, test and set, block release. But again, the uh, kinds of data structures I'm talking about today, mainly concurrent queues and uh, dequeues, are going to be based on compare and swap. So the first question that we need to ask ourselves as Haskellers is, do we actually need all this stuff? Um, Simon Marlow has a nice quote that I completely agree with. Uh, he said, I rather like the simplicity of pure data structures in mutable containers, and they perform very well. So in spite of being here today talking to you about this topic, I, I, I want to believe, believe this. Um, I wish I could. And uh, certainly, as a Haskell parallel concurrent programmer, you should always use this uh, as your first go-to solution. You should use atomic modify IORF. So this is really quite a nice capability that we have that is somewhat unique to the combination of laziness and uh, purity. We have all these great purely functional data structures in our libraries, and we have this operation which will allow us to atomically apply an arbitrarily complex function to the contents of an IRF. And that's where we rely on laziness, because we don't have to only do very quick little functions. We simply stick a thunk in there, and the work happens later. Okay, so uh, because of this capability, the Haskell programmer actually has access to quite a few uh, what would normally be considered concurrent data structures. If you need a concurrent stack, you have an IORF with a list in it. If you need a concurrent queue or deck, you have an IORF with a data.sequence in it. Uh, likewise, if in a, where in another language you would use a concurrent hash table, um, we can just put a data.map in an IORF. So this is a perfectly fine approach, um, and after what I tell you today, you'll probably still need to do this as your fallback approach for when your compare and swap based data structures don't work, so um, keep that in mind. And if this gave us good enough performance, then that would be wonderful because we would get to ignore all these um, headed producing papers from conferences like SPA where they produce an endless stream of these new data structures uh, for concurrent and scalable um, execution. So that would be great. Um, we could just blow it all away with our atomic modify IRF. But unfortunately, I'm not a believer yet. Uh, it has to come down to the performance, and it's hard to believe that we're going to make any synchronization mechanisms that are as efficient as uh, using the hardware provided ones. Uh, and my current benchmarks seem to indicate that that is indeed the case. Uh, here is a simple Michael Scott lock for Q compared to an atomic uh, modified IORF on an IORF containing a data dot sequence. So this is on a four core single socket uh, Westman machine. Um, and we're doing about 4x better on simple uh, contention micro benchmarks. So um, that's enough of a reason for me to think that we need to implement this class of data structures for Haskell, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I started putting together a couple packages, uh, some of which are in hackage, and the goal of the infrastructure that I'm building right now 
is to abstract some of the diversity of all these different algorithms. Because even just looking at concurrent queues, you have a lot of different variations. You uh, could need multi-threaded access on the writer end or on the reader end. You've got double-ended queues, single-ended queues, 1.5-ended queues, if you've heard of those, which are very important to work stealing. Uh, so inside our library, we have this very um, long uh, list of parameters to type thing. All right, so this actually is not as bad as it looks. So, so you just have to answer some simple questions about what you want. And, and this, by the way, does not leak out to the end user most of the time. Uh, so the idea here is, uh, is the left, it, we're going to be talking about left and right just to orient ourselves as a, as a metaphor. Of course, it's symmetric, it doesn't really matter. Um, but is the left end need to be thread safe? Does the right end need to be thread safe? Uh, so the most restricted, restricted scenario is you've only got a single thread that's writing and a single thread that's reading. And there are special implementations, in fact, that don't require atomic constructions at all that fit that particular scenario. So we want to use a matter of uh, uh, index type families to specify our constraints and get the best implementation. And also, as a pragmatic matter, I wanted to be able to provide a uh, forward scaling interface where I could only do one or two implementations to start, and I could just fill in some of these special cases later on as we get a chance to form more algorithms. All right, so let's continue on through our list. Uh, we're going to be plugging in phantom types here in a moment uh, to make these choices. Um, so we also want to know the um, whether or not, uh, there's a separate question of whether or not multiple threads are accessing one end of a particular queue, and whether or not that end of the queue supports both push and pop. So that's uh, the distinction between double-ended, single-ended, and 1.5-ended. So the way we do that right now, which you could actually argue with, uh, is a little silly because it uh, redundantly encodes the 1.5-ended case. But the way we do it right now is you say that the left end is either doubly capable or singly capable, and the right end is either doubly capable or singly capable. And finally, our last three uh, type parameters here, say whether or not the queue is bounded. Does it grow in memory, or does it have a fixed bound? Uh, does it allow duplicates? There are cases in some of these concurrent data structures, uh, as demonstrated by the um, item potent work stealer that uh, GHC uses, where if you allow low probability duplicates, you can do a little better, uh, save a little synchronization. Uh, so that's an important decision. And finally, you have the element type, which every data structure needs. Okay. So, uh, of course, we have some, some uninhabited phantom types here that are going to uh, express these choices. We can arrange those in a particular configuration. Um, and we have a bunch of type aliases for the common cases that you might care about. Here's a work stealing deck. So, what's important about a work stealing deck? Uh, it's essentially private to a worker. So, there's a single thread, it's non thread safe on the left end, uh, and only that thread can access it. But that thread can both push and pop work. Uh, hence, the left end is double ended, um, and other threads can steal work. So, the other end of it is, uh, has only pop, so it's single-ended. Um, the native operation on the right end, the convention here, is that the native operation on the right end is pop, and the native operation on the left end is push. Um, okay, so there's our work stealing deck. You usually want it to grow. You don't want to just stop um, pushing new tasks. Uh, although, maybe that's actually debatable. The spark pools, for example, are bounded in GH3. Okay, so um, we also do like REPA and have a single letter of, um, and shorthands for those things. So this can be as concise as that. Um, all right. So anyway, uh, what we want to expose to the user is actually a little, uh, little nicer than that. We, we hide this behind a few simple type classes that, enc uh, that encapsulate the basic queue operations. Um, so things like make a new queue, is the queue null, null, push, try to pop. So we have try to pop here because there's no blocking operations. Everything I'm talking about today has no integration with either lightweight threads or OS threads. So there's no notion of blocking data structures. Um, if something's not available, we have to deal with The client of this interface has to deal with it. So then uh, the functionality for the fancier cases where you're double-ended queues is stuck off in your own type classes. So your most basic kind of queue uh, can't pop on the left end, for example. Um, and actually, there's a little bit of a problem with how we've done bounding queues here, and I can talk to you about that later if you're interested. Okay, so the motivation of this particular setup is so that I can release a single package that has this interface for queues, uh, which I currently call abstract deck. Uh, it's been argued that for Haskell, we should probably use the existing Haskell terminology, so maybe this should be named deck-classes. But I would encourage everybody to do that. Because of all the dependency liabilities that, uh, that exist on package, it's great to keep your type classes in their own package. So that package should always install without any um, problems where you're missing some header for some C library. Uh, so then, depending on that, we uh, do some specific implementation. So today I'm only going to be talking about a simple lock for queue, the classic Michael Scott queue, which is in the Java standard library, uh, for example. Uh, 
Uh, also, we did an implementation of ChaseLev works in Dex. Those are the ones that are used inside the GHC runtime system. And then all of this gets bundled up. The whole point of this index type family is that all this stuff gets bundled up in a single mega deck package. And yeah, so the idea is if you just depend on the mega deck, um, then we can fill in a whole bunch more implementations in the future, and you don't have to worry about it. Of course, your Kabbalah installs will take longer and longer as we, as we do that. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic picture. The abstract deck is, is up on Hackage, and uh, this one should be, except it was down this morning. Hackage was down this morning for me, so I didn't upload it yet. Um, maybe because of all the activity at the conference. I don't know. Okay, so the basic task of taking one of these uh, algorithms out of one of these papers and porting it to Haskell um, should be straightforward because they have nice pseudocode that's often not even very long uh, inside the papers. Now, there's a high degree of trickiness per line in these particular algorithms because they're meant to deal with concurrency. So here's the, uh, half of the algorithm for the Michael Scott block for Q, and we, we're not going to read it, but, um, but the, the kind of qualitative point to make here is that actually the, lang the, the level of language that you need for doing this stuff is relatively restricted. So you don't need a lot of primitive operations. It mostly has to do with different kinds of pointer-based heap structures and swap, uh, swapping around pointers with compare and swap operations. And uh, so you don't need a lot of different stuff to get it to work. And I'm going to come back to that point at the very end of the talk today to try to leverage that. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and try to port the algorithm on the previous slide. Well, um, there's a little bit of work to do here, and uh, we have to take pseudocode that is kind of C-ish or Java-ish and translate it into IO-based uh, Haskell code. Um, so we come up with a data structure like this. Uh, the Microsoft lock for q is actually based on an extremely simple linked list. Um, there's a head and a tail pointer that are always populated, so there's always at least one cell allocated. Uh, but the list data type itself is very simple. Uh, it looks just like we would uh, expect a list, uh, recursive list data type to look like, except the Twitter field is mutable, of course. Um, all right, so then we go ahead and we try to write one of these uh, in queue operations, which in our case is called push L. So um, this looks straightforward, but uh, I've found personally that I have an embarrassing number of bugs when I try to port this kind of code. Um, I, there's, one, there's a couple things I really like about re-expressing these algorithms in Haskell. They, it makes you think a lot more about where the loads and stores are, because your C code tends to kind of obscure loads and stores, which we have to actually write the read.io ref, and th that, I think, helps a little bit, making it explicit. Um, all right, so what kind of bugs am I talking about? Well, there's a whole rogues gallery of different bugs that you can run into. I mean, these things are pretty tricky to implement in C, and we're kind of dealing with that plus um, some extra complications due to laziness. Okay, so uh, Haskell, because it doesn't have an operational semantics which specifies exactly what happens with heap objects, um, it reserves the a Haskell compiler. Uh, there might be many out there. Uh, Reserve the right to inline anything, of course, uh, to unbox data. Now, this is relevant because uh, the, under the hood here, we're depending on the only unsafe Haskell feature that is called really unsafe, to my knowledge, really unsafe pointer equality. Um, unsafe perform IO is just one unsafe. This is, this is really unsafe. Okay, so really unsafe pointer quality ultimately gets wrapped up into a type like this. And this type is very, very permissive. So it doesn't say anything about, you know, maybe you should have a class constraint that says, okay, this is actually a pointer. Um, because if unboxing happens and you end up with an int hash instead of an int, this, this will still work. Uh, well, not work, but, sorry. Yes, really insane. Well, I, maybe the really insane should be kept in name there. Sorry. Okay, so um, our Haskell implementation can also duplicate immutable heap objects. And this one is a big one, because the first time I ported the particular algorithm I showed you, um, we were doing compare and swaps on these pair values. So these pair values are, it's going to be a pointer, it's not going to get unboxed, that much we know, but uh, the garbage collector can still duplicate these objects, and that will of course completely screw up our pointer quality. So a good rule of thumb is to only do compare and swap operations on middle IRFs. Um, so that is one of the things that we need to follow, and we fix that bug by, uh, by not comparing the pair, but just explicitly comparing the cutter with the pair. Yes, so I see some, someone's brain is hurting already. Uh, was that a question? question I, I, I'm kind of wondering whether uh, anything that involves comparing pointers seems, you know, you're, you're, things are already dodgy now. So. Oh, right, indeed, indeed. So here's another quote for you. Um, so we can also wrap extra thunks in profondo, 
But uh, this, is, this is Simon Marlowe's comment on this topic. Indeed, there is no guarantee in general that your test will work, and HPC exposes one way in which it can fail. I'm sure you're aware of this. So your code won't work, I'm sure you're aware of this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but my argument is that, uh, so this won't work for Haskell, right? But it may work for GHC. So GHC is tameable uh, if we put out certain golden handcuffs. So we have to use no inline, we have to not use profiling, and we have to depend on this fact that garbage collection cannot duplicate an IRL. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the other lesson here is that we always need to fall back. So I mean this both statically and dynamically. So statically, uh, if you're going to run on a variety of Haskell compilers or in different compilation modes, this all needs to be treated as an optional optimization. So if thing, the hash if things are just right, use this code, else, um, fall back to your atomic modify IRL. Also, I mean fall back in the dynamic sense. So for example, our drop-in replacement for atomic modify IRL that uses compare and swap, uh, it uses a strategy at runtime where if the compare and swap doesn't work for a certain number of times, it will fall back to a different strategy. Um, okay, so with all those caveats, uh, now for some benchmarks. <laughs> So we've been applying these kinds of concurrent data structures in a couple of applications. Uh, one, of, one of which is, I shouldn't say we, um, because only one of them is ours. So the original reason that I got down into these beads is because we wanted to do parallel scheduling in Haskell uh, without extending the runtime system. So that meant that we needed these sorts of data structures for work scaling, specifically for Monad R's scheduler. And so that's how we got into this messy business. But since then, a couple of people have started picking up uh, this Q library and using it. So uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Nettle, but it's a very interesting DSL for programming uh, reconfigurable networks with OpenFlow. Uh, and so uh, Andreas, the student at Yale who's working on this, uh, is going to a great deal of trouble to make his implementation uh, have some parallel scaling. So he, his quote was uh, that he stuck this thing in and he got a pretty significant speed boost versus each hand data type. So, that's good, and that's the reason that we're doing this. Uh, okay, so I'm not actually gonna show you any results from those applications today. Uh, I am gonna show you a uh, micro benchmark. So if you download this package, or these packages, um, there are some micro benchmarks in there that will do simple stuff like this. You, you take eight threads on your machine, or uh, however many threads you like, and you split them up into two pairs, um, put a, a single queue between them. So this is kind of the simplest contention test you can do. You have a single queue being shared by the whole machine, and half the threads are readers, and half the threads are writers. Oops. So we've got other variations where we've got you know one-to-one -one pairs of queues, but this is the one I'm going to show you a couple graphs for today, and to, to try to get a sense of how we're doing relative to other implementations, uh, and relative to the, to the best we could do on the machine. Okay. Uh, so I'll show you in a moment actually how to run these uh, how to run these sorts of tests if you want to implement your own queue or use ours. Okay, so I already showed you this graph. This is how we do on a four-core single socket machine. Uh, the picture is similar, if not worse, on a 32-core machine. So here's our baseline strategy of atomic modify IRF versus our simple Michael Scott Q. And by the way, Michael Scott Q, as I'll show you in a slide or two, is not the state of the art. Um, there are significantly better algorithms than that available. But uh, so anyway, we do about eight times better. Um, one thing that's been interesting here is our reference implementation doesn't get any worse uh, after about six or eight times. Um, so this is pushing exactly 500,000 words through a queue uh, between, so in the 32 core thread mode, we're having 16 threads push uh, 500,000 divided by 16 elements through the central queue. So the amount of work isn't scaling here. Uh, what, what's the scale of what, microseconds? Uh, that's seconds. So this oh, is seconds. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought it said it on there. Uh, in both of these cases, it's seconds. Right. So that's not really great objective performance. Um, we're getting about, uh, well, here, I'll show you the next slide. OK, so some of my students did a pretty thorough benchmark with a bunch of the existing Q implementations that are out there. Um, so these are in libraries like libcds uh, in the Java 1.7 um, concurrency library, and also in threading building blocks from Intel. Um, so actually, one thing that comes out rather embarrassing here is that the TUB's concurrent Q, which are specifically specialized for this very purpose, do worse than a um, C++ standard library deck with a spin lock around it. Um, and that was a little bit surprising to me. So this is maximum throughput, um, passing a single word at a time uh, on only two cores. So one producer, one consumer. Just how much, uh, how much message passing can you do on a given machine? 
So the point that's relevant for us today, other than this being motivation for us to implement these algorithms, um, the point that's relevant for us today is to compare with what we've done in Haskell. Here's your Microsoft queue, um, and this is implemented in C. So they're getting, let's say to be conservative, they're getting 160 megabytes per second. Because of the particular way they did this benchmark, um, we have to divide by 16 to compare it to our number. So they're passing 85 words at a time, um, and they're double counting both the producer and the consumer. Okay, so we divide by 16, and we get about 10 million elements a second. So we can do 10 million NQs and 10 million DQs in every second uh, with this implementation. So that is about four times better than our current Haskell implementation, which was about eight times better than atomic modified IRF. So that gives you some sense of where we are in absolute terms. Um, we can probably do, do something better than that. And by the way, the people who implement these sorts of algorithms pay a lot of attention to specialized memory management strategies for these particular algorithms. So a lot of these underscores here refer to the specific memory manager that was attached to that implementation to do this benchmark. Um, and as you might suspect, just one more comment on the previous slide, as you might suspect, sending a word at a time is not a great way to approximate the maximum throughput of the machine. If you send a cache line at a time, you get closer to that, and you get about five times better performance. Okay, so this is all still very early days. Um, GHC just got the ability to generate compare and swap instructions in 7.2, except it's broken, so please don't use it there. There was a bug. I'm missing uh, GC uh, memory variable. And uh, it works in 7.4, so you can download this today with 7.4 and use it. Um, there's a patch that I need to get somebody to merge in for compare and swap on arrays. Right now we just have it on IRFs and STFs, um, but that should be easy. And in fact, it's pretty easy to add the other operations too. So if you're interested in doing that, I can send you a little recipe uh, for how to make a patch for GHC that will do uh, fetch and add or any of the other operations you need. And the final thing I'd like to talk about today in the last couple of minutes is if anybody has any great ideas for turning, we got sucked into this as I mentioned, just trying to get something that would work for Monad Car. But if anybody has any great ideas for how to turn this from an implementation chore into a research challenge, that would be great. So that would justify us spending more time working on this. Uh, and one small idea just to throw out there is I already mentioned how we only need a fairly small set of operations to implement these data structures. So uh, we're essentially writing strict code in the IO monad that should be isomorphic to C code. Um, so one idea we had when trying to debug these algorithms was uh, why not just write this in the ESL and generate the C implementation on the side? And then we could at least see if the C implementation works and the Haskell one doesn't. It's probably one of those suspects that I mentioned, such as the compiler playing tricks. So that would be a sort of fun thing to do. Um, we did a little prototype of this, but I haven't done much with it yet. In particular, I haven't actually implemented this kind of Haskell thing that I'm about to show you. So uh, we would need to do something that EDSLs don't usually do, which is include some types. So it's easy to do ES EDSLs for hints, but we need we can't overlook really case, of course, right? So we would want to have a little template Haskell macro that generates a bunch of code. Right now, I've handwritten the code uh, that would be produced by this little data declaration, which would enable me to write my previous algorithm that I showed you like this. So this is the same code, it's just written in a little ESL so that, for example, we say case pair and we pass two lambdas for the null and the cons case instead of using an actual case expression. But um, if we write our algorithm like this, then perhaps we can generate other um, external to Haskell implementations from it as a, a way of having two versions to test against one another. So that's just a, one idea. All right, and that's it. All right, uh, questions? Oh, are you picking me? Okay. So you mentioned using IOMAPs. Are you actually using IOMAPs or are you using mutual, mutual variables being built in? Mm. Yeah, yes. well, IOMAP, as far as I know, is another wrapper. Uh, it's a heap structure that points to a mutual, which then points to the real mutual thing. Oh, I see. So you're, you're saying this not because you would want to ever use it with an ST ref, but because uh, you think there may be a performance advantage. All right. Yeah, so that's, that's actually a really good point. We, we haven't done that. Um, our initial thought, which it sounds like was wrong, was, well, you never want to use this in ST because it's never going to be deterministic. So we didn't worry about it. But, uh, but you're right. We should unpackage that. Thanks.
Good tip. So my, my, my question was more or less the same thing. So my question is more or less the same thing because I've noticed uh, a number of times when putting stuff from C like, you know, I want to be destructive and, and imperative into Haskell is that IO refs are incredibly slow mm -hmm. compared to the seemingly analogous thing in C. So, so I would definitely say like aim for the, the sort of primitive, like you, what the SCG actually uses for mutability would be a lot better, I think. Sure, and in fact, this makes it more embarrassing, right? That we're already beating the, the atomic mod by IRF uh, by quite a bit. But yeah, we should do that. Maybe we can start to close that for us. Uh, if you need a use case for this, I have a good one in GHC. Oh, so GHC IO Manager is a gigantic uh, IO ref, I think, around the map. And we suspect that's a point of contention when we scale IO Manager up to uh, many more cores. Good point. Yes, Gregory and I had a GSOC that was supposed to be looking at concurrent hash table study. Sadly, it didn't work out. Maybe that's somewhere. Yeah, so IOFs are indeed just boxes, so, they, so they're subject to duplication. Mm. Much of anything else. Oh my, I wonder yeah, what went away. I thought that might worry you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this just that 10 years the whole thing is. It's amazing what was wrong. <laughs> but the other thing I was, I'm very uncomfortable about this whole hobby is about comparing stuff. Mm -hmm. right? So I wonder, there, there was, on some architectures you get, instead of CAS, you get load, lock, store, conditional. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has a, has a kind of different flavor. It's, it's almost like you, you load it over, they get a bit of it, then you store it back. And if you, if you get to store it back before somebody else modifies it, that's what you want to know. Right, um, and that might be a better fit. In some ways, this business about comparing on pointers, that's all, uh, somehow that feels like the wrong thing. Maybe, but I know that not everybody provides a load box or conditional. Maybe a weird way of thinking about it that could maybe do casing differently. I was very, I've been inarticulate, but somehow it feels wrong. Uh, so you mentioned really unsafe pointer quality uh, earlier, and I don't see it in this code. Is 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 the CAS yeah. primitive itself safe? No, it's based on unsafe pointer quality. <laughs> it should be called really unsafe CAS. Really unsafe CAS. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, CAS is internally doing uh, a second instance of really unsafe pointer quality. Um, so it, it looks like we don't have it in this particular code, but in many cases we would be saying um, our head, the head tail pointer uh, equal. Um, I guess it's not quite on this slide, but it's elsewhere in the code. Uh -huh. So we essentially need a primitive that uses the same notion of equality as the built-in cast. So anybody that you're saying that even atomic modified IORF cast is not internally safe? Mm. No, it should be safe. It should because be safe. anything right. that goes wrong should just cause it to fail, which causes it to fall back onto a normal atomic modified IORF. So it's just a, it should be a safe optimization. Okay. Any other questions? Good.